Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we talk about literature. Today, we're continuing our discussion of The Tenet of Wildfell Hall. This is the third episode, and previously we've covered some background information about Anne, we've covered the structure of the novel, we've had a discussion of the religion and the vices of the various characters. It's all in the playlist, I'll have it linked down below and also at the end, so be sure to check out the other videos in this series. For today, we're going to be talking about marriage, class, and feminism. All right, so to kick it off with marriage, it's important to see this novel as still advocating marriage while criticizing the way that some people employ it. In the end, Gilbert and Helen do get married. Here we see the novel or the narrator advocating matches based on merit and equality. Both Gilbert and Helen are imperfect people, but they are both interested in constantly growing to become better people. They are also intellectual and moral matches for each other. They are definitely not social matches. At the end of the novel, when Gilbert finally sees the home that Helen grew up in and the status that he's, she's used to, he's almost embarrassed to propose. It is clear that they're from totally different social circles, and despite this disparity, the novel shows their match to be a good one. Contrarywise, we of course have Helen's first marriage to Arthur Huntington. There is no equal match here. They are from the social, same social status, similar in wealth, similar in intellect, if different in interest. And the novel still points out how woefully mismatched they are, and that's primarily on the basis of morals and worldview. Another example of a bad marriage is the low, low boroughs. Lord Loborough is also an imperfect character. He's a recovering alcoholic. He does himself no favors by hanging out with the people that he hangs out with, who have wild parties and drink heavily. Likewise, the wife he chooses for himself, Annabella, is vain and makes fun of his moral efforts. Here again, the novel criticizes people who choose a moral mismatch for themselves in their marriages. A final character worth analyzing here is Walter Hargrave. In some ways, we see an overlap between Gilbert and Walter. Mr. Hargrave keeps company with Arthur Huntington and his friends, but he's sort of shown to be not as bad as the other ones. So he drinks, but not as heavily. He uh, laughs at the jokes, but he doesn't make them, that sort of thing. Mr. Hargrave is complicit in the worldview uh, that Huntington and his friends represent. He also tries to take advantage of his position, knowing that Helen must be looking for a way to escape her marriage to Huntington. Hargrave offers himself as a refuge, knowing he could coerce her into a romantic relationship with him. He reveals himself to be ultimately predatory, not seeking the highest good for her or for himself, but only his own selfish desires. Through marriage, perhaps more than in any other way, the novel explores social mobility. Every time I read this novel, I'm really struck by that closing scene where Markham visits um, Helen after Mar Huntington has passed away, and he is taken to Helen's aunt's house where she grew up, and the extreme difference in their stations. He almost doesn't visit her, and when he does, he's muted. He doesn't know how to proceed. Helen is almost irritated with him for this response. She thought he understood that her view of compatibility is based on their shared Christian faith and character. Um, and this position is supported by the novel, as, as it makes the same basis for their good match. Um, in doing so, it implicitly erases the taboos of social jumping uh, through, or jumping through sto social status through marriage. Hargrave versus Markham. So let's also take a look here and uh, see how Markham and Hargrave are different and what they accomplish uh, different from each other, even though they both are interested in Helen. Um, so they both want to have a romantic relationship with Helen, but Hargrave knows that Helen is married. She tries to convince, um, he, no, he tries to convince her to run away with him, have an affair with him, and he argues that her escape is justified by Huntington's abuse and cheating. Markham, on the other hand, does not know that she is still married when he falls in love with her. Believing her to be a widow, he consistently concedes to friendship with her, even though he is... <laughs> believes there's no moral reason why they couldn't get married. When he learns that she is not a widow, but has narrowly her escaped her husband's abuse with the help of her brother, he gives her his friendship without trying to coerce her. The character of Hargrave, I think, is particularly relevant to our modern dating culture. 
Hargrave does not take no for an answer. Whenever Helen makes it clear that despite her husband's cruel choices, she's not going to cross that moral line um, that she set for herself, he does not respect her boundaries. Hargrave is not able to offer honest friendship to her. He's never willing to give up his own romantic desires and offer just friendship. His friendliness is always a way for him to try to slide into a relationship, the one that he really wants from her. And Hargrave turns cruel when he doesn't get his own way. As Helen continues to stand firm in her moral position, he gets angry and cruel. And even though she has been honest from the start about what she believes and what she wants and what she stands for, he still gets mean when her adherence to her principles prevents him from getting what he wants. He thinks that she should make an exception for him. Another really important topic to cover here is feminism. Hargrave is a great transition for this <laughs> topic as well. At the core of the novel's feminist ar ar arguments are these two central ideas. One, women are the moral equals of men. They are equally capable of good or evil and equally responsible for their choices. Two, society is not organized in such a way to reflect this reality. Women are expected to be the moral derivative of their fathers or husbands. Since women do not have the freedom to live, to have property, to have jobs, they are not able to enact their own moral autonomy. Instead of being equally responsible for their choices, they are victims of the undue power that men have in their lives. Helen's insistence that her own moral perspective in the face of Huntington's vices uh, and in the face of, Hunt of Hargrave's desires continues to put her in conflict with these men who want to, her to capitulate to their desires. It also puts her in conflict with the social circle at large. When she comes as the widow, she sort of looked at askance and questioned. Helen's strong moral perspective can only exist under the presupposition that she is a fully autonomous and equal person to man man to men. While many other characters might concede to the truth of this statement, Helen's argument with Gilbert early on in the novel um, about how boys and girls are raised differently reveals some unconscious contradictions of this, pr of this principle. Um, during one visit with the neighborhood, Gilbert's mom declares that Helen is raising her boy like a girl, being too protective of him, right? And Helen's counterpoint is that she's actually educating him and leading him until he's old enough to be able to make decisions on his own and moral decisions for himself. The general crowd advocates like toughening up boys and letting them make mistakes while protecting girls and shielding them from the outside world. Helen points out this contradiction. Why should girls be protected from the difficulties of life, but not boys? Why should there be a difference in the way that boys and girls are educated and brought up? Why should girls be protected to the point that they're made ignorant of the threats to their moral character and to their lives as they enter into the world, unable to encounter them with knowledge? Of course, she's speaking from her own experience here and the way that she was brought up. Finally, Helen points out that the in, uh, insistence to protect girls, but not boys, shows that the society believes that girls are so weak as to be unable to handle temptations or difficulties, while boys are apparently strengthened by exposure to them. Here, Helen points out that while society holds boy, both boys and girls responsible for their moral decisions, sometimes girls even more so than boys, they are not given equal preparation to encounter the world that they will have to live in. Boys are given the opportunity to be entrapped with vices before they are even old enough to understand them. In another part of the novel, we see Huntington encouraging his toddler to drink alcohol, while girls, perhaps thinking of herself, are ignorant, unable to identify and avoid men like Huntington who would deceive and entrap women for their own desires. So. That's all I have for you guys to, for today. I hope you enjoyed our discussion of marriage and class and feminism uh, as it relates to the tenant of Wildfell Hall. If you get value out of these episodes, consider giving this video a like or subscribing to my channel. And if you're looking for other ways to support my channel, consider becoming a patron. The links are always in the description box, as well as all of my social links. Of course, I am a lovely jaunt everywhere. So um, look me up there. And until next time, I'm Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.